Rob, you are the Director of Center for Pollinators in Energy at French Energy. As a director, you're helping accelerate the nation's transition to use of clean and renewable energy. And your work has been covered in National Geographic, the New York Times, and the Wall Street Journal. So you, you launched technology startups and you created the international crowdsourced campaign celebrating version 1.0 of the FireWeb browsers. And now your main focus is how can solar energy align the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis, right? So no, Rob, um, we are listening to you. Wonderful to be here. Wonderful to be with you. And thank you also make, uh, so much for making some time in your day today. Uh, uh, and uh, I guess if you could just pop to the first slide, um, the title of my talk today is, uh, is uh, looking at photovoltaic or PV solar and how we are innovating in designs uh, in a way that is encouraging and toward uh, stacking more benefits into these power plants and that we're going from one set of designs to another. So you could go ahead and move to the, to the next slide. So at the, at the early stages of the photovoltaic solar uh, revolution, you know, uh, we, we started a lot of this in some of the sunniest places. Um, and um, a lot of those places happen to be in desert and sandy landscapes, very arid landscapes that have an incredible solar resource. Um, and so designs like this one that's pictured have become a very common uh, commonplace site. Uh, as you go to the next slide, you can see how these, these designs have been, uh, have kind of carried over uh, the Rocky Mountains of the United States from the arid southwest into other areas of the country, and they're also being used on, on uh, uh, lands that, that can support vegetation. Um, and so this mindset of, you know, this is how we build solar, uh, has carried across into places like Georgia and Ohio, and even, uh, next slide, uh, into large portions of the Midwest where, you know, the idea of doing bare ground or uh, acres and acres and tons and tons of crushed rock under and around uh, photovoltaic solar projects uh, has created, uh, next slide, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of conflict. Now, of course, this is not all designs of solar. It's just that there is still a meaningful amount, a large amount of solar that's being used with these designs that either think about bare ground or, um, or crushed rock or even just monocrop turf grass. Um, and so as we think about the future, maybe there's a way to accelerate uh, into a better land use and, uh, and improve the functioning of this system. So you can go to the next slide. Concurrently, we see exceptional uh, risks. So tomorrow is World Bee Day. Uh, two days later is International Biodiversity Day. There is a huge and urgent problem to address the biodiversity crisis. Um, so, and this is a real uh, challenge for agricultural producers because crops are at risk. Uh, next slide. Uh, even here in the United States, what's happening today is that there's not enough uh, little insects, the pollinators that move pollen from flower to flower. There's not enough of them to maximize the crop yields for a, a, a number of high value specialty crops. Next slide. Um, and so this is the work that these insects do. They visit flowers, they get all up covered in, in pollen, they move to the next flower, they pollinate those. Um, and it's, it, most people think and just take for granted that it's one visit and then on to the next. However, next slide, here's what it looks like when crops get insufficient pollination. When it, instead of they, maybe they need two or three visits, they get only one or maybe a, just a partial visit. So all of these delicious specialty crops need uh, numerous visits from bees to maximize their yield. So in the next slide, you can see what you tend to you know, appreciate when you go to a grocery store or a market. You know, this is what a blueberry looks like. This is what a strawberry looks like. Well, you know, for a blueberry, you need one to two visits for each and every single one of those flowers. For strawberries, you need 20 to 60 visits uh, by, by pollinators to each one of those flowers. So we need to make sure that we're aware of the urgency of the biodiversity crisis and the intersection that this thing has uh, with our food system. So if you go to the next slide, as we start thinking about how to pair these things together, um, maybe there's a magical solution um, that can combine biodiversity and clean energy uh, to make productive use of the land and improve the efficiency of the system. Next slide. 
And I'll give a, a lot of credit to uh, to NG, uh, friends, uh, uh, a company headquartered, global company headquartered in Paris that is bringing this practice to scale. They have more than 100 megawatts of projects in you know more than 10 states here in the United States uh, that use a high diversity uh, seed mix growing under and around the panels. Uh, next slide. And in some of their projects, actually, there's Amish and other farmers that are making productive use of the land outside the fence, using the enriched ecosystem services from the solar farm to improve the crop yields of the watermelon, of the tomato, of the squash, and other crops. And so what's happening inside the fence from a biodiversity perspective can meaningfully influence and benefit the agriculture happening outside the fence. Next slide. The co-benefits of this, these, uh, these systems are, uh, are emerging very quickly and beginning to be understood thanks to a lot of uh, sensors and measurements and data and research that is happening on these projects. But so these, um, by co-locating these two things together, biodiversity and clean energy, we're finding a way to scale and accelerate into this clean energy revolution while still um, making sure that we're stacking benefits and, and providing um, you know, other, additional operational benefits to the system itself. So, and I don't expect anyone to read this slide in the short time we have today, but again, the, uh, the presentations are all archived, so you can go back to it later. Um, next slide, please. So about that research. So uh, folks at the National Renewable Energy Lab are doing some really incredible research on this topic. Uh, next slide. This study called INSPIRE is, uh, has more than 25 sites all around the United States and has sensors on these sites and various test plots evaluating the vegetative performance, the insect response, and other methods of co-locating agriculture and solar, and as well of providing uh, additional ecosystem service benefits to area crops. Next slide. One of those, um, of those insights is that this practice of pollinator-friendly solar, of providing a diverse mix of flowering plants inside the array, can meaningfully benefit a lot of different kinds of agriculture outside the fence. Uh, next slide. And now for the next few slides, I guess I'll just add, um, well, so what is agrivoltaics? Of course, you can grow crops, but you can also do uh, diverse uh, com flower communities under and around uh, the panels. Uh, next slide. And then also, this is some of the data of, in, uh, indicating that the pollinator habitat works, that the beneficial insects show up, that energy production is actually increased from a cooler microclimate, and that O&M costs, the cost of mowing these projects, actually goes down. And so instead of having to mow them two or three or four or five times a year, you're actually mowing them once a year or maybe once every other year. So there's meaningful operational benefits as well. Next slide. The additional research is looking at the, uh, the, the way that these projects can handle stormwater and uh, sequester carbon on these projects. So next slide. You see what a cross section of a solar array can look like with these deep rooted perennial plants. On the far left of the slide, you see the shallow rooted turf grass and how weak that looks and inefficient as a system under a multi-million dollar you know, solar energy facility. You really want high performance vegetation for a high performance clean energy future. So uh, these deep rooted plants are managing that stormwater, capturing it coming off the panels. And, uh, and so in the next slide, you'll see some of the research that's happening in this, uh, in this space. The PV Smart project, you can just Google PV Smart and NREL. And in the next slide, you'll see several of the sensors that are installed on these sites to model the hydrological performance of these systems and how deep-rooted perennial vegetation, diverse and perennial vegetation, can do a better job at cooling the panels, managing the stormwater, and improving the overall uh, ecosystem services of this as a system. Next slide. Um, what's encouraging to me as well, just very briefly, from a tipping point perspective, is that more and more companies and states and municipalities are using tools like this, a pollinator-friendly solar scorecard. And so you can go to the next slide. And it's been adopted in so many states in different places. Michigan has opened 3 million acres to solar development for projects that meet these kind of criteria. Massachusetts is actually rewarding developers with an increased payment for projects that look like this. And so let's see some, what some of them look like. And you could just spend you know, two seconds on each of the next three or four slides that show great pictures. I'll tell you when to stop. Yep, go ahead.
So it's really great as well. I mean, NG is doing a fantastic job, a beautiful job, uh, as well as NL, uh, the Italian, uh, Italy-based multinational. Uh, the practice of pollinator-friendly solar is uh, increasingly common all around the United States. This is in, in Vermont. I believe the next slide shows a picture in, in Texas. Uh, and then the next slide shows uh, projects in, in uh, Oregon, as well as in Minnesota. Uh, and then, you know, since we're talking about tipping points, uh, the next slide shows this exciting practice of pairing up beehives with these practices. So in the next slide, you see what this looks like. Increasingly, there's a cultural expectation that we can make productive use of the land under and around these panels. In the next slide, you'll see how honey harvested from these flowering pollinator-friendly solar farms is used as a hero ingredient in, uh, in beer, in craft beer, which is a great way to get people excited about the clean energy future. Uh, the next slide shows uh, one of the beers that's actually now being served at the International Flower uh, Show at, uh, at Walt Disney World of Honey Bee Citrus Ale. And in the next slide, um, we just wrap it all together and talk about all of the uh, stewardship benefits that can result from this. The monarch butterfly is one that makes this incredible journey, the length of, uh, nearly the length of North America. Um, and as we ask more and more and see more and more solar, there's more ways for us to stack and combine these benefits and ex experience an exciting tipping point. Which brings me to one last th thought uh, on the next slide, which is really about cultural norming. And so there's this exciting company that helps us think about engineering and think about designing the future. And Lego has this exciting platform called Lego Ideas. And so this is a project called the Lego Solar Farm. You can go and vote for it actually. And if it gets 10,000 votes from folks like you and folks in your network, then Lego will consider putting it in a commercial kit available in stores worldwide. So it's just called the Lego Solar Farm. Uh, it's just legosolarfarm.me. So I appreciate your, your all's time. Uh, Fresh Energy is a nonprofit that works to advance and accelerate this stacking and co-benefits uh, work related to solar energy. Thank you.